Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask our guests here in-house if you'll be so kind to make a courtesy check. Cell phones being silenced is always appreciated. We will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage following our presentations. And our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion is Hans von Spakovsky, who is our senior legal fellow and our manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative in our Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He is an authority on a wide range of legal issues, including civil rights, civil justice, the First Amendment, immigration, the rule of law, and government reform. Before joining us at Heritage, he was on the Federal Election Commission for two years. He worked at the Department of Justice as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. He is also a former litigator, in-house counsel, and senior corporate officer in the insurance industry. Please join me in welcoming Hans von Spakovsky. Hans. Thanks, John, and everyone, welcome to uh, the Heritage Foundation. And uh, before we get started, I, I did want to tell you this is our third uh, event in the Preserve the Constitution series, uh, a, a series we do every fall that was started by uh, former Ger Attorney General Ed Meese. And I did want to tell you next week will be our next event, Thursday, October 8th, uh, Due Process Goes to School, How to Handle Campus Sexual Assault Cases, which is a very uh, important issue right now. Now, critics of the current campaign process for state and federal elections uh, are urging states and Congress to require uh, nonprofit uh, advocacy organizations and others to disclose the identity of their donors to the government and thus the public uh, if they engage in political speech and discussion of public policy issues. Now, Americans and uh, Advocacy organizations are already subject to campaign disclosure requirements under state and federal laws. For example, the names, home addresses, occupations, and employers of anyone contributing to a federal candidate uh, has to be dis uh, disclosed with very similar disclosure requirements under state laws applying to state elections. Political action committees have to disclose all their contributors and donors and nonprofit organizations that are engaging in independent political expenditures that urge the support or opposition of a particular candidate also have to file very detailed uh, disclosure reports, uh, expenditure reports with the government. However, should nonprofit organizations that are not PACs be forced to disclose their private donors as a condition of speaking about public issues and politics in general, uh, if it might have some effect on an election. Uh, this requirement, would it violate uh, the First Amendment, associational and free speech rights, or is this a necessary requirement for transparency that benefits the public and informs their ability to make choices in the election process? Uh, do mandatory disclosure requirements violate the right to privacy? And can it negatively affect the ability of nonprofits to actually get their voices out on issues? Well, we've got two of the nation's leading experts on the First Amendment and candidate finance rules here to speak about this today. I'm going to introduce both of them and then uh, let them get going. First, we're going to hear from John Samples, who's a vice president at the Cato Institute where he founded and directs Cato's Center for Representative Government. I think he's also the publisher of the Cato Institute Press, uh, which means, John, that Cato, I think, is taking advantage of you. You're doing three jobs for the salary of one. Uh, he's a former director of the Georgetown University Press and the former vice president of the 20th Century Fund. Like Brad Smith, uh, he is a widely published author, and you've probably also seen heard or read him everywhere from Fox News to MSNBC to NPR to the New York Times. He's the author of The Struggle to Limit Government, A Modern Political History, and The Fallacy of Campaign Finance Reform. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Brad Smith, who's a former chairman uh, of the Federal Election Commission. He is the current chairman and founder of the Center for Competitive Politics. Uh, he serves as the Blackmore Nault Designated Professor of Law at Capital University Law School. Uh, 
He also sits on the Board of Trustees of the Buckeye Institute in Ohio. He's a senior fellow at the Goldwater Institute and a member of the Board of Scholars of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Now, a recent New York Times story referred to Brad as the, quote, intellectual powerhouse of the movement to roll back campaign finance restrictions. And due to his honesty and integrity in the area of campaign finance law, the Wall Street Journal has called him, quote, the only honorable man in this bordello, <laughs> which is certainly an intriguing uh, comment on the campaign finance area. Now, you've probably read his articles uh, in publications ranging from the Wall Street Journal to National Review. You've seen him on the O'Reilly Factor and the PBS NewsHour, or heard him on NPR and other radio programs. He's also the author of Unfree Speech, The Folly of Campaign Finance Reform. So first, we're going to hear from John Samples. Thank you, Hans. It's great to be at Heritage, and it's great to be speaking today to so many prominent people. And I also see uh, many old friends from these uh, long and seemingly endless debates and struggles about campaign finance. I would start by reminding us all that those struggles were very much worthwhile. We've achieved a lot. And the issue is always the same. Well, it's going to be technical things today talked about, but the issue is always the same. It's the First Amendment, and we have to keep that in mind. That we are fortunate to live in a country that has a constitution and, by and large, has a, a Supreme Court that has recognized that government may not abridge freedom of the press or freedom of speech or of the press. And that is what we need to keep in our sights. Today I want to talk about a couple of things in that light about disclosure. I want to talk about what I think of as the old disclosure and the new. And I, I think there's some reasons to make those distinctions that give us some insights about where we are today. Uh, the old disclosure will be familiar to many of us. It was the disclosure of the Federal Election Campaign Act. It's the ideas of the 1970s. The ideas of, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, validated in Buckley versus Vallejo, the idea that disclosure could, while potentially uh, chilling speech, potentially violating the First Amendment, in general actually was possibly constitutional. And indeed, of course, Buckley found uh, disclosure, mandatory disclosure. And it is important to always keep in mind you need that adjective, mandatory, because people forget that. They act like it's just something that happens. There is such a thing as voluntary disclosure. We're always talking about mandatory because that is what potentially threatens First Amendment rights. The old disclosure involved uh, ultimately a relationship between uh, a potential elected official, a candidate for office, and a disclosed donor. The rights at stake were by and large thought after Buckley to be those of the donor uh, whose rights were threatened. The public official had no rights uh, uh, ultimately to receive donations. The goal, as you well know, there were twin goals of preventing corruption for mandated disclosure and uh, educational value uh, of the, for the voters. Voters were said to look to this disclosed information to figure out who to vote for. Now, one theme we could have here that I think needs to be kept in mind, but it's not necessarily at the forefront of the, these debates, is the idea that actually there's not a lot of evidence that these constitutional goals, these constitutional purposes are actually fulfilled by disclosure. Potentially the educational idea, for example, is one that really is kind of hard to believe, although there's political science theories about it, the actual data is not very good. And it's something to keep in mind, that actually disclosure does what it says or purports to do. And I want to go into that, what it actually purports to do, a little bit in a minute. Um, but the 70s were also a time, the old disclosure was one where technology was limited. Sure, who, who had time to go down to the FEC and look up who was uh, uh, donating to whom or go to a state capital. Well, newspapers did, but the information was slowly got out. Uh, there was no sense in at least, and I'd be happy to be uh, uh, disabused of this, but my sense of reading the history is not a sense of a mob atmosphere developing around disclosures at all. Um, and it, a crucial issue here about the old disclosure, if, if you recall, both sides ultimately thought that disclosure was both uh, inevitable 
And it, in a sense, it was the minimal, the goal. So indeed, in Buckley itself, one of the arguments that was considered but not offered uh, was that you know disclosure? You would have just a disclosure-only regime, and for years, many of us in this room argued for a disclosure-only regime, because the alternatives, apart from everything else about disclosure, the alternatives were much worse. They were prohibitions, they were limitations, contribution limits, and so on and so forth. So, what comes out of that, and when I began in this business, was the idea that it's only disclosure. You know the phrase, right? And that, that was the sense that disclosure was, in any kind of debate or political struggle about this, was a starting point that could be assumed by reformers. I was thought of as the least harmful in, um, alternative, despite the fact that there was a sense of the possibilities of government retaliation. And the problems were the arguments that there was certainly a f harmful effects that you could uh, see from um, government actions under the old disclosure. But most of it was probably a chilling of speech that was hard to, to uh, commit or find out about in terms of data, in terms of uh, legal cases. Still, the truth was, and has remained to this day, that uh, there's this kind of um, appearance, as it were, of goals for uh, disclosure, the old disclosure, which was anti-corruption and education, and on the other hand, a real actual political goal. And the real actual political goal was to disclose donors, thereby, uh, if not threatening them, at least putting them through the difficult uh, process of being uh, potentially personally attacked. And the whole point was this was a political uh, kind of strategy in which you could win elections or change the outcome of elections, perhaps, or at least make elections, it was thought, uh, more equal, perhaps, or more fair, whatever you called it, by discouraging the donors of people uh, that you really didn't think in the end had all that much of a legitimate role to play in American democracy. I mean, if we tell the truth about it, I think, and you have some idea of the history of all of this, the political realism should be kept in mind. Now, the new disclosure is different from this. It doesn't, it's not a corruption uh, argument because it involves advocates and disclosed donors. Right now, I am acting as an advocate that works for the Cato Institute. Right? And the fact that I'm here has something to do with the fact that Cato has donors. It doesn't have anything to do with public policy. It doesn't have anything to do with a vote or uh, access or any of those issues. But it also means that there are heavy rights at stake in the sense of my right here, or as a work for the Cato Institute, to uh, speak out. And uh, also, um, donors have a right of association that would be clearly threatened by uh, disclosure. I should say also the striking thing about the new disclosure, the, particularly the idea of uh, disclosing donors to C3s, is that the goals are actually unclear. The corruption, the um, educational goal, does anyone really look to uh, donations to assess public policy work or public policy advocacy? Uh, would that actually happen? It's, it's even less likely, I think, than with elections. Um, so what is the goal? What is the purpose? And more than that, what is the important government purpose that justifies what is really threats to First Amendment rights? Uh, the public interest is unknown, and that should matter a lot because there are important uh, First Amendment rights at issue. And the new disclosure also comes in a different era. Um, Bruce Kane, a professor of political science at Stanford, has noted, and he did this a couple of years ago when things have, were calmer than they are now, that the uh, internet, the political uses of the internet, the low cost of organizing and so on, have made it uh, a very different world in which dis uh, disclosed name, disclosed donations uh, can be known and in fact connected very quickly to political efforts. So the, all the old political realism, the purpose of discouraging people becomes all the easier to do, discouraging people from exercising First Amendment rights, becomes easier to do. And in fact, uh, we notice that uh, this technology is already led, led to specific harms. People have to be aware that donations to groups can lead pretty quickly to uh, all sorts of outcomes, bad outcomes like losing their job and 
the usual problems of uh, being attacked and criticized in public. I would add also under the new disclosure that there's a big issue, which is that it's now seen as the only tool of regulation after Citizens United. I think that has something to do with its spreading from its traditional uses in elections, and it also um, raises the stakes for the people, the reformers, who want to bring about, I think, a, a different kind of outcome here, a different kind of, of disclosure. Um, there is an issue here, which is the, the threats that I'm talking about, brought about by new uh, communication technology, are governmental to be sure, but they are also non-governmental, right? The, the Twitter mob may or may not be instigated by a uh, government official, but it could be just uh, a spontaneous organization. And that's something that has to be thought about. It doesn't mean that I am not gonna advocate here or at any time that government should have a right to control those kinds of speech. But we have to keep in mind what is at stake here. This is com disclosure is compelled speech by the government. That's where this starts, okay? And in that sense, if th that just is not justified, then we don't get to the point where we um, um, have this kind of uh, problem. Now, um, to conclude, and I think we want to have plenty of time for questions and answers, it seems uh, to me that one, there's a several problems with this. Chilling of speech through harms from these kinds of disclosures, there's no real reason, no government role for that, uh, for forcing this kind of disclosures. Um, the other point I would, another point I would make is that it's very likely to keep, in, and we should keep in mind, is that this kind of uh, mandatory disclosure will spread widely and even from the start, if it's only applied to, say, the Cato Institute or similar institutions, it's going to lead to a decline in the quality of speech, right? The idea of um, a, a low quality public speech will become more of a reality because it will spread uh, to an, uh, essentially a question of motives rather than content, which, and deprive the country, I think, in many respects of the deliberative qualities you get from freedom of speech. The good news that I will finish on is that it seems to me if we go down this path, and I think we should not, if we go down this path, it's likely to generate uh, unlikely coalitions of opposition. It has in the past. I think it will do so in the future. It may even do so before we go down the path. By that, I mean this is not a political tactic that is going to be constrained to just one group of people. That You may have that uh, belief going in. Uh, a public official may have that belief that this is a way sim uh, simply to cut off money from libertarian or conservative organizations. But politics has uh, is become sophisticated. It will spread rapidly and it will apply to everyone. And everyone's donors will be uh, subject to these kinds of problems. All in all, given the First Amendment quality of it and um, the fact that I think it will apply to everyone, I'm hopeful that we're not going to go down the path of, toward C3s. And if we do, and we have some to some extent, I will hope that the, the courts will step in and protect that First Amendment that we're so lucky to live under. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, John. Thank you, Hans. Uh, I appreciate it. It's nice to see a uh, number. We would have a pretty good federal election commission here. We've got Commissioner Hunter and Commissioner Peterson and Commissioner Goodman, Commissioner Von Spakovsky, my former colleague, uh, whom it's a great pleasure to work with on the commission, Dave Mason. I think we'd be a pretty good, darn good commission. <laughs> I think that would, and six, six people would be great. Um, and I, uh, I appreciate you mentioning that Wall Street Journal editorial from, from years ago. This is a true story. I, I went home that night and I said to my wife, I said, you know, wasn't this, did you see that editorial in the Wall Street Journal today? And she looks at me and she says, and what were you doing in a bordello? That, was, <laughs> that really was her response. So um, let's see. I want to talk a little bit uh, today to follow up on some of John thinks, John's points and talk a little bit about the constitutional law, but also about the, some of the more concrete uh, efforts being used now on the disclosure front. Um, you know, it's worth noting that at the core of the IRS scandal has been the issue of disclosure, right? People forget this. Why was the IRS 
holding up these 501c4 applications. Why did it matter? What would have happened if these groups were not allowed to register as 501c4s? The answer is they would probably have had to register as 527s. That is a different section of the tax code. And what is the difference between a, a group that registers under C4 and a group that registers under 527 and does exactly the same thing as any of those Tea Party groups was going to do? From a tax revenue standpoint, the difference is nothing. Their revenue is not taxed, and the donors to those groups do not get a tax break. So what was the issue about? The issue was, if the groups had to register as a 527, they would have to publicly disclose their donors. And they might have the black mark of that they could be accused of being partisan political groups rather than uh, groups of citizens interested in issues and policy. So it's sometimes worth remembering that we've already seen the power of the government very recently go to work on this question of uh, disclosure. Um, currently, there have been efforts to push the disclosure in a number of directions. Uh, uh, people have been unable to get legislation through Congress. Uh, they've been unable to get regulations through the FEC, which is set up to be bipartisan, and it's perceived as a partisan effort. So they've turned to other regulatory agencies. Some effort has been made to get the FCC, the Communications Commission, to do more regulation because, well, they regulate the broadcast, so they should be able to say that you have to disclose who's paying for your commercials. Uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, Jim Call, who would then be our general counsel, I guess, at the FEC. Jim was associate general counsel for a time while I was there, and Jim noted uh, an incident that occurred when, in part because the FCC has no experience in handling disclosure, they were putting information out publicly that allowed people to hack bank accounts of some of the advertisers, if I remember that, that story correctly. They've also gone to the Securities and Exchange Commission on the idea, well, you regulate corporations, publicly traded corporations, so you regulate what the companies do. Uh, one waits for the moment when they go to the Federal Reserve and say, well, you print the money and they spend money, why don't you regulate it under that theory? Um, they're going anywhere they can to try to get this stuff regulated. Now, one question that's always raised, and, and John kind of hinted at this, is they say, well, when did conservatives change? You used to favor disclosure, and now suddenly you're against it. Well, what a load of BS. Um, we, I'm going to speak frankly here. No, we should remember, right, that we have more public disclosure now of political and issue-related speech than we have ever had at any time in our nation's history, period. There is no exception to that, right? And in the past, when conservatives said, well, you know, they tend to say we'd favor a disclosure-only regime, they were talking about, as John said, disclosure of contributions and spending by polit political campaigns, political parties, things for direct partisan activity. What is now sought is not that kind of disclosure, but rather disclosure of things like dues paid to trade associations, uh, donations to social welfare organizations, right? Uh, and these, by the way, social welfare is a very broad term. It includes groups like the National Rifle Association, the Sierra Club, all kinds of groups like that that are, of course, very involved in trying to shape people's attitudes toward the issues facing our society and in trying to educate the public about nuances of these issues. Uh, they want information about donations to think tanks, that is, organizations like the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Foundation, where John works, or the Center for Competitive Politics that I found it. Groups, and these C3 groups, as John noted, do not do any endorsements of candidates. They do not involve, uh, they're not, they're prohibited from, from lobbying and from political activity. But obviously, they're putting out ideas, and ideas scare some people. And the goal, I think, is fairly clearly to scare some donors away and scare them into submission, into not contributing. So what has changed is not the position, I think, that conservatives and libertarians hold about what should be disclosed, but rather the extent of disclosure that is being demanded by the disclosure fanatics and the use of that disclosure, which, as John noted, partly because of technology, partly because maybe our politics has just gotten more partisan, a little more personal and mean, but that 
disclosure information now is not used to inform the public. The, the, the idea is that a voter can sit there and say, boy, I don't know anything about these groups. I, these guys are saying this. These guys are saying that. I don't know who to believe. But if you could see who was funding them, you might say, oh, well, this group's funded by the unions, so now I know where they're coming from. I think maybe they're slanting their speech. This group's funded by the corporations. And, you know, you might understand the, the message a bit more. That's not how people use it. And that's not how the purveyors of more disclosure want it to be used. Their approach is very different. Their approach is, I hate that speech. I want it to stop. And we're going to try to make sure the people who are making that speech suffer in ways unrelated to that speech. We're going to boycott their businesses. We're going to demand that they be fired and boycott their employers until they are fired. We're going to threaten them. Right? We're going to descend with these constant vituperation and these Twitter mobs and so on. We're going to protest outside their homes of their executives. Right? They are not trying to engage in a battle of ideas. They are trying to physically or otherwise harm people in a way unrelated to those ideas to make them stop expressing those ideas. So what has changed in this debate is not the position I think of us, but the position of certain others. Now, in requiring mandated disclosure, again, it's important we go back to this idea that we're talking mandated disclosure, the government ordering people to do something. We should note that there is a long history of constitutional protection for anonymous speech in this country. The best cases go back to the 1940s and the 1950s. Uh, these are cases often involving the civil rights union or, or movement, in some cases revol involving the union movement. Uh, Thomas V. Cullen's a case that said union organizers did not have to disclose who they were. But the biggest case people most know about is a case called NAACP versus Alabama. Uh, in the 50s, the state of Alabama wanted to get information on the NAACP. Who are your donors? Who are your members? And you can imagine the pressure and the threats that might have placed on donors to the NAACP at that time in that location and what that might have done to their political speech. Now, fortunately, we're in a position, and, and I should add, by the way, there are then a series of cases that follow up on these numerous civil rights cases, cases like Bates v. Little Rock, NAACP versus Button, Talley versus California, which protects the anon anonymity of picketers. You don't have to disclose who paid for your signs and things like that. Uh, but also cases relating to campaign finance, such as Buckley v. Vallejo itself, McIntyre versus Ohio Election Commission, that uphold some kind of right to speak anonymously for people whose primary goal is not to influence political politics, but that's just an incidental thing to their, to their uh, general activities. Buckley held that very clearly, right, that disclosure should be limited to candidates and political committees, not to everybody who might talk about things that might vaguely affect an election. Um, but um, <clears throat> uh, there's also a deep, just a history in the United States of anonymous political speech. I mean, we go back to, to Thomas Paine publishing Common Sense, to the Federalist Papers. Those are always the most famous examples, the ones that are so often used. But there are many, many others. The great Chief Justice John Marshall used to write anonymous uh, articles explaining his court opinions, because he wanted the public to have a better understanding of what they were doing. Abraham Lincoln used to publish anonymous letters. You can go down the, the treasure trove of great Americans and find a tremendous amount of anonymous speech. Most of the speech surrounding the debate over the Constitution was done by people using pseudonyms precisely so that people would have to deal with the arguments involved rather than deal with the um, uh, with ad hominem attacks on the various authors and writers. Uh, so this is what we're talking about. Do you have a right, should you, know, should you have to report to the government your memberships in various associations, the causes and interests that you support? Okay. And I think that a lot of us are more concerned when we think about it in those terms. When we think about, should you have a big government database that says who's members to what, who supports what groups, who is communicating with whom? And this is what we are talking about here. Now, I want to talk about a couple of particular cases that uh, my organization, the Center for Competitive Politics, is involved in because they illustrate both the nature of the new effort at disclosure and the effort to do some, some pushback and think about what we really ought to have in the United States. One is a case called Delaware Strong Families versus Delaware. Delaware Strong Families is a 501c3 group. Again, that means it is prohibited under the tax code from engaging in partisan politics. It doesn't do any political activity. What it does publish is a list or a, a scorecard of how your representatives or the people of Delaware's representatives have voted in the legislature. 
you would think this would be a good thing. But for various reasons, again, some people don't want to disclose this kind of charity. And by the way, the reasons people don't want to do it are, are numerous. The Buffalo News had an editorial today saying, anybody who doesn't want to disclose, we should be suspicious of their motives. But people want to, don't want to disclose for all kinds of reasons. Many people, their religious code says they should be quiet about their charity and not trumpet it out, right? Other people just don't want their neighbors to know how much money they have. Some people don't want reporters asking them questions, and some people don't want other groups coming and asking them for money when it's apparent that they can make large contributions or even modest contributions. Okay. Well, so Delaware Strong Families is such a group, and the state says we need to know all of your donors because it's, quote, election-related. That is, in some vague way, it might affect an election. Well, you know, we think of almost everything we do might affect an election. I mean, should we have to report to the government a list of all the people who are in attendance here today? These are people, these are maybe, maybe dangerous people hearing dangerous ideas and so on, right? I mean, all kinds of things might affect an election but they're not engaged in any kind of partisan politics. And uh, this is a case that we won an injunction in the district court. Uh, it was overruled by the Third uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and we expect to uh, probably be uh, filing a cert brief with the Supreme Court in, uh, in November. The uh, other case is one that's being brought in our own name, and I think this is a very important case that really illustrates the problems here. This is a case called Center for Competitive Politics versus Harris. Now, Harris is the Attorney General of California, and a couple years ago she decided, there's no statute on this or anything, she just decided administratively, didn't go through a public rulemaking, she just decided that in order to do her job as the state's chief regulator of nonprofit organizations, she needed to know the names of donors to any organization. And so if you want to solicit in the state of California, you have to now provide the state of California with the names of all of your donors. By the way, the Attorney General of New York is attempting the same thing. If you're any kind of charity that has at all national ambitions and even many state ambitions, right, and you can't solicit people in California or New York, you're kind of out of the game. That's where an awful lot of the United States money is, right? Well, you have to disclose all of these donors. And why do you have to do that? This is the question that we asked of the Attorney General. They'd never required it before, had never really seemed to be a problem. And the Attorney General's response was, well, we might need it for law enforcement. And in the back and forth of pleadings and briefs, our position was, and what kind of law enforcement did you have in mind? And the answer was, just law enforcement. We might need it. Now, the position that we have taken throughout this litigation, which is brought in our own names as a group from whom they're seeking this information, one of the first groups from whom they sought it, is that if the state had a reason to investigate an organization, or if the state, in accordance with traditional administrative law, had a, had a routinized process of audits, right, they could get this information. But they can't just demand it of everybody as a prerequisite to doing the most basic kind of speech activity in the state, which is asking somebody else, will you support us? They have no business with that. And they have never been able to provide a rationale for why they need this information. The conclusion I draw is that they have no rationale for why they need this other information, other than essentially they want to intimidate donors. This is part of a partisan campaign to stop people from pr producing ideas that they do not like. I hate to put it that way, but yes, at Attorney General Harris, Jay accused, this is what you're doing. You're trying to intimidate people and get them to stop giving. There's no reason that the state needs this information. Um, now notice, well, the change, in the, this goes even beyond speech. Notice the, the core assumption here that's different. Our assumption has always been, for example, that the purpose of disclosure is to allow the people to monitor the government, right? What are your, exec your elected officials doing? Where are they getting money from? Right? The state of California's view seems to be, no, no, no. The purpose of disclosure is to allow the state to monitor you, to monitor the people. The state wants to follow up on the people. And I have to think that that is wrong. That case is now uh, before the Supreme Court on cert. We've gotten wonderful uh, amicus support from a number of nonprofit groups, a large number of nonprofit groups, from the Philanthropy Roundtable, from the Attorney Generals of three states who have said, hey, we're concerned about the privacy rights of our citizens in our state. Because even if uh, the citizen is from Arizona or from Michigan or from South Carolina, right, that donor has to be disclosed to the Attorney General of California for her 
law enforcement purpose. Right? And by the way, can you get that information from the Attorney General? Well, the Attorney General of California doesn't know. Can you make a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request under California law? Well, the Attorney General of California says, well, we'd probably contest that, but we don't really know what the answer is. In other words, it might be something you could legally, someone could legally then demand from the Attorney General of California. So that case is Harris versus California. And I think it will tell us a great deal if the court takes the case and how they rule. And if they don't take the case, it will tell us a great deal about whether there are going to be any protections left for personal privacy in the United States to voice ideas. And remember that when we talk about voicing ideas, you know, the idea is the people who most need privacy are not, in fact, the big powerful interest. The people who most need privacy are people who are voicing new ideas, unpopular ideas, right? The people who need privacy are the people who are saying things that go against the grain and are trying to persuade folks. Okay. And we're going to cut that off, as you see with the NAACP cases. And it may be true that few people now face the kind of threats you might have faced in the 50s for giving to the NAACP, but we should ask ourselves just how big a threat should you have to face before the government forces you to hand information over to those who would threaten you? I tend to think the answer is pretty much none. I don't think the government has a business in forcing you to hand over information that will enable other people to threaten you. So that's what I think is really at stake here, and I think uh, we're going to find out very soon whether the Supreme Court really believes that there should be freedom to assemble, freedom to share ideas, or whether the government should have the right to simply monitor with whom you're talking and with what it is that you're talking about. Thank you. Thanks, Brad, John. Uh, well, we do have time for questions, and uh, if you would wait for the microphone uh, to come in, because we are broadcasting this over the internet, and if you just uh, identify who you are and then uh, ask a question. Anyone? Todd? <laughs> Todd Gaziano from the Pacific Legal Foundation. A great uh, uh, presentation, both of you. But I think this, uh, my question focuses more on the, uh, the ending of, of what uh, uh, Brad was, was talking about. When I was trying to get um, PLF, by the way, is one of, one of their amici supporting you in, in, uh, in your cert petition, and, and I imagine we would in the other one as well. Um, but when I was trying to get a prominent First Amendment liberal to help write in support of that, the distinction um, that he made was that NAACP versus Alabama and others, um, there was a clear and obvious showing that there would be physical violence. This was the, the era of lynchings. There were murder, late, you know, the ones in Mississippi happened a little later, but this that was the era. And uh, assuming um, you know, rational basis uh, review, what evidence is there, maybe that's a big assumption that you want to address, um, what evidence is there that um, the, average, the average donor uh, would suffer physical threats? You know, Scalia seems to be of the view in some cases that, you know, if, if you're just going to be made fun of and teased, that's the rough and tumble of, of both politics, maybe, and other types of contributions. Why, 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 why should why 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 should a state have to 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 sure. meet and this? It's, and it's easy for a man with life tenure in his job and Secret Service protection to say that. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think I think first it's a, it's a good point, and I tried to make this point. Look, this is not the NAACP in the Deep South in the 1950s. Okay, that's actually why I prefer to rely more on, for example, Buckley v. Vallejo or Thomas v. Collins or cases like that which clearly recognize that and still say, again, you know, the government has to have some basis for this. And this is the thing I would argue. Now, now, first you say, what is the rational basis? And for those who aren't lawyers, I think we've got many lawyers here, but, you know, normally there's different standards of review by which the court is deferential to uh, the legislature's des desire. Generally speaking, when you infringe on a First Amendment right, you need something more than a rational basis, right? You need a higher uh, government interest, a more compelling government interest. And there's not really any doubt that there is a First Amendment in anonymity and in association. So we argue that first the government obviously should have a higher basis than, than rational review, which is what we suggest that the Ninth Circuit actually applied. But I would say that I don't even think it passes rational review. 
uh, I mean, a rational basis. I mean, again, I, I don't think the state of California has any reason for the information, any legitimate reason. Nobody has denied, again, that they can get this if they have actually a system of administrative inspections, you know, to routinely audit certain groups or something like that, just as OSHA would come around now and then and check on businesses on a kind of a basis, uh, or that they would have a, the ability to get the information if they needed it for a, a for-cause investigation. They had a complaint or something else that would give them uh, need of it. They just want it for the hell of it, or to maybe intimidate particular donors. We cannot overlook the fact that this has been a liberal hobby horse since Citizens United, and a great many liberals have said quite bluntly that this is the one tool we have left to try to control and limit political spending. And, and that really, I think, is the goal, to use both official and, and informal retaliation. So I, I think that this is a big problem. But the other thing I would say again is what I said at the end is, how big a threat should we have to have? You know, I mean, I know Scalia, again, life, life tenured, Secret Service protection, it's got to be a pretty big threat, right? But how big really should it be? You know, the incentives to fund ideas or to engage in talk about public issues, right, is, is very thin. I mean, if you donate to Heritage or Cato or the Senate for Competitive Elections, you're just out money at the end. You get a tax break, but you're still out money, right? And what do you get for it? You get a bunch of people in this room listening to us on a panel, you know? Uh, you know? How much does that help you for living out in Omaha, right? I mean, you have to really believe in this stuff. And now if you learn that if you do this, right, you're going to have protesters outside your pizza shop in Elkhart, right? Or you're going to have, you know, whatever else it is. You're going to have threats to your kids in school. You're just going to have to put up with nasty, so many nasty messages you have to close your Twitter account and so on. Why bother? Why do this? And I think this is the real you know, threat that we take. There is substantial evidence of harassment. The National Organization for Marriage especially can show it. There's cases of people being fired from their jobs because their employers are threatened with boycotts and so on. I mean, we do have quite a bit of evidence. And one of the things that really disturbs me is that many members on the Supreme Court, when they've taken these cases so far, have had a very you know, seem to have a very high standard for what you need to face in terms of a threat. And I just don't think the First Amendment's intended to be that way. Again, remember, we're talking about the government forcing you to give other people the information that they want to use to then threaten and harass you. And I just think that, that you shouldn't have, either the government should have to show really compelling interest to do that, or you should not have to show very much at all to say, no, they, they can't do that in this case. Yeah, I agree with all that. I would emphasize the move toward a rational basis test. But I would also put a slightly different spin on it that I was trying to make during my uh, discussion, which is that we need to think of about old and new and think about the new disclosure as different. It's a cultural fact here, right? We got so long we thought of disclosure as a, a de minimis kind of thing that we had to accept. Uh, at Cato, you know, it's become clear to me that we made a kind of a mistake because we accepted mandatory disclosure. We did that because uh, that was the price for being part of legitimate conversation on this. And it worked out pretty well for us in the sense that we were able to ultimately, I think, win some victories or contribute to victories that many people in this room have contributed to. But it is mandatory disclosure. We were caught up in that, that that is the sort of, you know, necessary. And it's also harmless. It's not really asking any. Thing from anybody. I think the choice we face here is we're going to find out that that's not true under, because of technology and because of uh, political partisanship and so on. And it's only a question of time before everybody agrees that that's not true, right? So if we go down this path, it's not as if the left is going to be free of this because the technology is not of uh, dispersion of ideas and of abuse is not solely in newspapers that they control anymore. It's everywhere, and everyone can use it. So we're either going to find out, uh, decide that this is harmful and not a good thing for the republic at the end of the day when everybody's injured, or right now when we don't go down this path would be my, my argument. And we should change the culture. Just don't, us, don't go with the, ones, the idea we've grown up with that it's just disclosure. When you hear that, there's a problem. Another question? Yeah. I'm Ken Doyle, reporter with BNA. I wanted to ask Brad Smith, um, 
Do you have a prediction about the Supreme Court? Uh, you said you mentioned it's going to be pretty soon that we'll know what they're going to do with your case. And if they don't grant cert, uh, what what would the situation be then? What would be the next move be? Do you think? Well, um, I, I don't make predictions generally uh, about the Supreme Court. Uh, the one prediction I always made that came out right was that Anthony Kennedy was nowhere near being the swing vote in Citizens United that he would be lock solid for the majority and of course he wrote the majority opinion but uh, otherwise um, you know I, I think it depends on whether the court sees the kind of points that John's been raising that we're not just talking about political disclosure of contributions to candidates and political committees, that we're talking about something that cuts much deeper into American civic life than that. And that's why I think it's so important that we have the support of attorney generals who say, we're worried about the privacy of our citizens. Why it's important that we have the philanthropy roundtable that says, look, there's lots of pe reasons why people give to our charities uh, and want to remain anonymous, and, and this would be impossible to do. I think if the court sees it that way, I think they will draw a line. Now, I'm not sure they'll draw the line you know, where I would want it, but I think they would at least draw a line that says, yes, there are certain areas that are off limits to government, again, without showing a compelling reason for the information. If the court does not take the case, or even worse, if they take it and rule for the state of California, uh, I think it's, you know, Katie bar the door, sort of as John says, we're going to have a complete uh, takeover. In terms of will they take it, I won't offer pr prediction, but I will say, I mean, I think we've got a very strong brief up there. Uh, again, we've gotten a lot of amicus support that I think from a broad array of groups and types of organizations that I think will signal to the court that this is an important case in American civic life. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that they will take it and, I, and, and say there are limits to what the state can disclose. Maybe California, you can get this information, but you at least have to give some kind of reason for it. And to highlight it, that maybe it has some chance of being taken, it's interesting that today's SCOTUS blog, which some of you are familiar with, that monitors the Supreme Court doings quite closely and so on, has it listed as the petition of the day. They feature each day a petition that they think raises an important issue that the court is going to take up sooner or later, if not in this case, then in another one. I hope they take it up here because I think this case is, at first, I think they need to do it, and I, I think this case uh, really presents the issue cleanly and well. All right. Any, any other questions? We've convinced them. <laughs> it was an easy crowd, though. <laughs> right. uh, well, for those of you who uh, want to see this again, just a reminder, within 24 hours, we'll, we'll have a video up on the uh, website uh, uh, talking about all of this. So uh, thank you for coming to Heritage. And don't forget our event next week on due process on campuses or perhaps the lack of due process on campuses these days. Thank you. Thank you.